Three, two, one, roll the footage. Welcome back, everybody, to the Strategy Sprints podcast. I'm your host, Simon Severino. What if you could hang out with sprinters and ask them about their problems, their workflows, and their solutions? That's exactly what we do every day here on the podcast. And today, we explore with the author of the New York Times bestselling book, 48 Days to the Work You Love, how to find or create the work you love, what protecting your mornings can do for you, how one book can make you two millions in 18 months if you do it like him, what 300 signed copies can do for you and why you need a 3 a.m. list. Welcome, everybody. Dan Miller. Hey, thank hey, Dan. You. Hey, I'm delighted to be here. Great introduction. Thank you. We are excited because many of us, like also myself, we are planning about, we are writing a book or we are promoting a book right now or we are on tour. And so we will take notes here. But first, what are you currently creating? My next book. No surprise. I love writing and I've had uh, some books that I really love. You mentioned, you know, one of them. I've had others out there like Wisdom Meets Passion, Rudder of the Day. But my next book is going to be titled An Understanding Heart. Now, here's why I'm so excited about it. I've never been more excited about a book getting out there because I'm going to do it counterintuitive to everything that we know about publishing today. It's going to be done like this little book right here, five by seven, leather cover, gold edge pages, bookmark, very expensive, all the things that publishers cringe about. They're trying to make books shorter, cheaper, deliver digitally. I'm going to something that's going to be heavy when you hold it, high price point. I'm going to use my signature number, $48 for the book. So wow. I've never been more excited about getting a product out there than this. And some people now listening say, hey, wait a moment. On Amazon, the one thing that matters is the cover. How will the cover look like? Ah, it'll be it'll be subtle because it won't be, you know, it won't be harsh graphics mm. like this. It'll be very, very subtle, but that's okay. It'll be marketed differently. It'll mm -hmm. be marketed in a much different way than just something you see on a shelf in a bookstore or on a graphic at Amazon. This is where that idea of having a warm audience already really comes into play. Yeah. And tell us more. So everything that we should do, you have decided to do differently. Yes. Walk us through the, through the process of coming up with these different ways and why do you break with intention the rules? <laughs> Part of it is just the concept itself. You know, Earl Nightingale said years and years ago, uh, when he's the author of The Strangest Secret, but said, if everybody's going in one direction, you probably need to go the other way. One of the death knolls for any idea that my kids had growing up was to come home and say, well, dad, everyone else is doing it. Because my <laughs> response would be, if everyone else is doing it, we probably need to look at something else. So I just think counterintuitively, and that's where great ideas often originate, just do it differently. Mm -hmm. So everything in the common mainstream is telling us, you know, make it cheaper, quicker, faster. Well, that's kind of a race to the bottom. There's still a place for something that has high value, a standalone, and I'm violating all the rules. But I, I like physical books. And I read online, obviously, a lot, of, a lot of people. But I love the feel, the smell, the touch of a real book. So to make a book high end in that space where it really feels like something important that you would have in the coffee table. I'm just going there again, publishers. I, I've got a very unique arrangement with a publisher for distribution, but I didn't even ask my traditional publishers to go with me in this space. They do not want something that's that expensive to print that has the delayed shipping from China or Thailand, which is where it'll be printed. But I've been around long enough. I earned the right to just do it my way, so to speak. I'm not trying to be throw it in anybody's face, but it's my project and I have a real clear vision for how I want it delivered. Most people listening right now 
we are quite at the beginning. It's maybe our first or second book or third book. It, can you remember your first book? And can you share with us the 300 copies that you have signed by hand? And how, how did you do the first promotions? It really evolved. I did not have, I didn't do a book in the way that it's typically done, where I sat down, wrote a manuscript, we scheduled a launch date. It didn't happen like that. My material that is now 48 Days to the Work You Love evolved out of teaching the Sunday school class. I didn't have any intention of being an author or selling a book, but I was teaching a Sunday school class on career life transitions, just how to help people navigate these inevitable, relentless transitions we're confronted with. And so I had people start to ask me, well, I've got a son-in-law that's been without work for three months. I want him to hear what you just told us. What do you have that I can give him? I didn't have anything. Those requests kept coming. So I put together just my rough notes for that class in a three ring binder and started selling it. And it really took off. So it was very, it was, I was catching up with the demand for the content before I put it together in a fancy format. And I sold just that three ring binder initially. And we sold a lot. We initially with a cassette tape. And then I started putting two audio CDs in there, but it's a very rough format. But it didn't matter because people started buying it and they buy it, bought it generously. And even back then, I was selling that. I showed it at $49.95 being the price, but you could get it on the internet for $39. I showed a, a discount. I showed a, a money back guarantee. If you don't find the work you love in 48 days, I'll give you your money back. That was the premise. I was using some of the old marketing gurus like Jay Abraham, that risk reversal. I've just always been experimenting with ideas around my books, not just staying in the traditional path. And Simon, as you probably know, I mean, we're told that 95% of authors never make more than $40,000 a year. That's pretty discouraging if you have any kind of financial goals. I didn't care. I simply said, how tough would it be to put myself in the 5% category? And so I looked at what authors typically do, and I've always tried to look for things that they do not do that I try with the books that I release. And when we talk 2 million from one book, are we talking from books sold or from your services in the back end? No, we're talking just that three ring binder. Yeah, you know, re you're referring to a real significant time where right at the beginning when I had that little three ring binder and I was listening to people like Mark Victor Hansen, co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, he was going to do an event in Los Angeles, Mega Book University. And I thought, well, he's done pretty well with Chicken Soup for the Soul. I could learn from this guy. So my wife and I went, we sat there and listened. And I came back and just started doing some of the nurture marketing things that he talked about. And in the next 30 months, I sold over, well, 18 months in that case, I sold over $2 million worth of that three ring binder, selling them at $39 a piece. Wow, that's impressive. Not many books do that. And uh, now you are, you are still on the road. One thing in between was 300 hand-signed copies sent by you to 300 people. How did you pick the people? What did you add to the book? A specific letter? Uh, tell us through the details. I've done that with every book, and I'll, I'll do that with my new book as well. That's my marketing plan. That works better than anything I've ever seen. Now, those are people who are influencers, but those are not just random people that I pull out of a hat who have never heard of me. Those are all people with whom I've developed deep relationships over the years. So I've always put a lot of focus on that. I mean, I, I develop relationships. That's what drives my business more than fancy SEO or buying Facebook ads or anything. The relationships. So as an example, when I just released the 20th anniversary edition of 48 Days to the Work You Love, I told my, my team, says, oh, you need to do, you know, lots of interviews. I said, look, I'll agree to do 48 interviews, just my signature number. I said, I'll do that. I didn't want to switch all my efforts to that. I said, I'll do 48 interviews. So I sent out 50 copies of that book to people who do have audiences without anything else. I immediately booked 36 of those interviews. And then by follow-up, we filled the others very quickly. But that's the power of having those relationships. And those are the people who get those initial books. Again, not as a surprise to anybody, 
but it's people where I've already shared life together in some way. Oh, so the 50 go to podcasters, uh, media outlets, media influencers, and 252 people that you know that you have worked with, but that you know that they might also promote the book. Absolutely. These are sneezers. These are people who love me and care about me, and I do the same with them. And so it's a very natural connection when that comes out. And the thing is, as you might expect, I mean, it's reciprocal. I have promoted tons of books and products and courses and seminars, events for those people along the way. So it's a very natural next response for them to say, well, sure, we'll promote your book. And I've also, I dedicate Monday afternoons to doing just forwards and endorsements for books. So I've always got books waiting to be reviewed. And I've done that for hundreds of books where I provide an endorsement. Well, then again, it's a natural reciprocal response if I send a book of mine out for the people to promote it for me. Beautiful. It's all relationship-based. And um, it's not scalable. It's real. It's human. It's giving first. And that is, and that is your your uh, recipe for success. One other piece that is in this philosophy that I really like is your 3 a.m. list. Can you unpack that? <laughs> 3 a.m. list means who could I call at 3 a.m. in the morning who could care enough about me if I was in a jam of some kind that they would take my call, drop what they're doing, fly, drive, or send me $10,000. That's kind of the criteria I put on there. Not that it's just about money, but people who would care enough that they would send me $10,000 without question. I developed that list. I want people on that list. You know, if you're operating in a silo in today's economy, you're going to struggle. So that's very important to me. And there are people on there who I've been friends with, you know, for 30 years, I mean, a long time. But there are also some that I've been friends with for a year. But again, they're relationships that I've developed where there's a caring, sharing kind of philosophy. What I want to do and what I encourage people to do is to have a 3 a.m. list with as, at least as many people on there as your age in years. So if you're 40 years old, have 40 people on your 3 a.m. list. And I've got currently 102 people on my list. I mean, I know exactly because I review that because those are relationships I want to really protect. So I happen to have 102. I'm not 102 years old, but I've, I've got a little margin there and I've got more than what I even recommend. But very important, a 3 a.m. list. And we have somebody already, Rob Helming. You can call me anytime. <laughs> Your list has just grown to 103. <laughs> well, I'm delighted. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. So, yeah, this is beautiful. And it is real and it is true. And it's not a tactic or something that comes and goes and can be hyped. This is just how humans how humans are, right? We, we care about each other. We support each other. We challenge each other. We grow with each other, right? Here's, here's how this works. I see a lot of people who at conferences, they'll approach somebody never met him before, they meet him, and in the first five minutes, they try to sell him on being in their mastermind. Hmm. You know, why would you do that? You know, How have you developed rapport and trust with this person? But well, we lead so quickly with just our product. I meet with a lot of people, no agenda at all. I meant we have lunch together, end of lunch, that's it. I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm reaping the benefits of those meetings, those relationships, now that were developed years ago. And frankly, as an example, to get into my mastermind, I protect that very carefully. There's 30 people in there, but nobody gets an invitation to that unless I've known them for probably at least two years. I meet people. We, we often do cruises, group cruises. We'll have people on there and I meet them. I think, boy, this is somebody that's really sharp. I don't even then invite them into my highest level of engagement. I start watching them. I just watch what they do for a couple of years. And if they really do things with character and integrity and impress me with how innovative and creative they are, then that invitation may come. But I, I look much more at the long game than a lot of players do today. They get out there, they've got a big launch process, a lot of hype. They want to talk people into taking action now. 
we never heard of them yesterday. Eh, I know it can be done. There are things that work, but it's just not my style. I love this. And I have learned this the hard way. Had, had I heard this before, maybe I could have had a couple mistakes less. And we have also a question here, again, from Rob. When do you decide when people are added to the list or not added to the list? My 3 a.m. list? Those are people that I've known for a long time. Those are people that I've had some kind of interaction with. Now, they may have come to me as a coaching client initially, or I may have purchased something from them or gone to one of their conferences and over time gotten to know them. Again, there's gonna, that implies that I've known somebody for probably at least two years to be considered to be on that list. But then as I develop deep relationships with people, it seems natural where I know there's that kind of trust established there. I don't talk to these people and say, you know, would you send me $10,000 at three o'clock in the morning? But based on the level of sharing life together, and relationship that we have, I add them without any question. And I have had that discussion with people and had a lot of people, in fact, confirm because they hear me talking about it. And there are people who ask, am I on that list? <laughs> so it's been fun to kind of check myself on that and get affirmation that, in fact, that is true. <laughs> I am so curious, who do you pick for the strategy award after one word from our sponsors? Hey, if you love what you are hearing, you will love our free masterclasses. Go grab them at strategiesprints.com. So you can pick one person when everybody's zigging, this person is zigging, but from your perspective, they are doing the right things. Who do you pick? The Chris Niemeyer. Hmm. Chris Niemeyer is a member of my mastermind. Chris had a very, very successful travel agency. He's the one that booked the group cruises that I did. And that's primarily what he would do, booking cruises for entrepreneurial groups. So it'd be big groups at one time. So he had a high six-figure net income from that business. Last year, COVID hit. That business not only went to zero revenue, he had hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people who had paid in advance for cruises that needed to be refunded. Their hard cost plus his commissions refunded. The business went totally down. Chris didn't sit there crying tears. He simply picked himself up. What am I going to pivot to? And he pivoted. He got involved in heavy real estate investing. He's very, very creative in that space heavily involved in cryptocurrency right now, Bitcoin and others, but has not only survived, I mean, he just texted me a couple of days ago, said he's looking at getting a Maserati for the family car. What do I recommend? Because I'm a car guy. <laughs> well, he's done extremely well in this period of time by pivoting. And I love people who are like that, who don't see themselves as victims, no matter what happens, even if it's unexpected, as that certainly was. Just, okay, what am I going to do next? Asking the question that I encourage people to ask, what does this make possible? And it's opened up some new doors that he wouldn't have recognized if he had not been put in that situation. Wow, that's powerful. And uh, yeah, the, the Bitcoin space is definitely a space to be right now. And um, I'm, I'm excited. So your new book, uh, when is it going to come out? What's your next, what's your August, next step there? August. I'm just finishing the final edits. It's been edited. I'm just finishing the final edits. And in this process, this is not where I, in working with traditional publishers, where they want a two-year lead time, where they you know, get the word out to PR people and get the word out to booksellers. I'm doing this totally behind the scenes, so I can just do this at my own speed. So even though I'm just now finishing the final edits, yeah, we expect to have the actual book in hand in August. And then I'll release it to those 300 people and we go from there. Wow. When I, when I, had my, when I released my last book with a traditional, with traditional publisher, you know, they said, well, we'll arrange to have 30 book signings, you know, in bookstores. I said, well, I hope you have a good time there. I won't be there, but I hope you have a good time. And they were like, what are you talking about? I said, you know, those don't work. They're just a vanity thing for the author. They don't make any sense at all. 
They're like, well, we know that, but every author wants that. I said, well, not me. I said, frankly, I'm more interested in where my book is three years from now than what it does in the first 30 days. Anybody can push that first 30 day blast and artificially play the game to get on a list and all that. I don't do that. I don't really care. But what I look at is the long game. And in doing that, my books serve me very, very well. And so what's the back end of your book? Because you use the book to start the conversation, to develop relationships. What happens in the buyer's journey after the book? Where does the book uh, in, inspire to go next? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of authors put a book out as an end product. That's it. And then they're disappointed at the revenue generated or lack thereof from the book. When I make a projections for my books, I project zero from the book itself. Now, certainly I get advances and royalties. That's fine. I can't control that. It's just like an expected bonus. But the real value is in what the book leads to. My books are full of reasons to people to engage with me at 48days.com and other ways. So they'll be exposed to coaching that I do, to a back-end seminar that I do, to ancillary products, swag connected with a book, to it, it engages me for speaking opportunity. What kind of swag did you create? Oh, we've got T-shirts and mouse pads and mugs and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, socks. I mean, my, my, oh, and here's the funny thing. My audience leads in that. My audience leads by getting products done and then sharing them with me. I don't have to do much in the creative space because I'm forever getting things sent to me, just creative things that they've done. So we've got little eagles. I use eagle symbology a lot. So I have lots of little eagle things that we've got around, around my office here and all little replicas and stuff. So they're doing that. But so things like that. Also, live events. Uh, we do live events. So people want to come to those. We have a membership community, online membership community, 48 Days Eagles. It's $48 a month. We have about 1,500 people in there right now. I want to build that to 10,000 people. Well, that gets pretty interesting, and it's my books that fuel those kind of things rather than looking at just the book itself as a source of revenue. Uh, the book is a, a nice-looking business card, and it introduces people to the back-end things where I do, in fact, make money. We have questions in the chat about the socks. Which colors do the socks have? <laughs> well, actually... They're, they're multicolored and they have eagles on them. They have 48 Days Eagles, the logo from our website. Just all, and the most popular ones are like um, red and black because that's the colors that we use typically. So, yeah, but just fun examples of things that people have done and sent to me. I have glasses, glasses with 48 Days on them. Uh, we have a, a brand new piece. Yeah. This is something that we just did. The best way to predict your future is to create it. Dan Miller. So it's it's just nicely framed. It's like on canvas. But we just we had somebody suggest that and we started producing those. And so now we have that available you know, for people to purchase. The little replicas of the eagle up there are available to purchase. They're a high ticket, they're they're $149 but they're an exact replica of a bronze eagle that I had sculpted that we have on our property. So yeah, there's lots of those ancillary things that are not just physical or, or not just regular print products, but are just ideas to keep the brand going. How do you see it? Is the job that you love, is it something that people find or do they have to create it? It can be both. But the, the key is to look inward first. That's the real key to my 48 days process. Most people you know, go through college, gee, who's hiring? What are the hottest trends out there? Even if looking for a business, you know, what's the hottest franchise? And that can be a short-term kind of solution and long-term frustration. 85% of the process of having a confidence of proper direction in your career business comes from looking inward first. How has God uniquely gifted you? What are your real true skills and abilities? What are your personality tendencies? What are your values, dreams, and passions? The more you know about yourself, the more 
confidence you can have in the focus you create. Then knowing that about yourself, then the 15% is to then find a job that blends all those things. If you can't find a job that blends all those things, sure, create something. Offer yourself to companies knowing what you know about yourself as your highest value to that company. But then we have a lot of people in today's age and time that can't find a job. And so they create something, you know, like Chris Niemeyer, who says, well, that didn't work. So what can I do? And he gets into a couple new areas, goes deeply into studying those and comes out a survivor. Three books that have inspired you as a reader. I'm sure you've heard all the popular ones a million times, Think and Grow Rich, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I'm going to give you three that are, are not going to be on that real popular list. Those certainly have influenced me a lot. But The Noticer by Andy Andrews is one that just is a profound book. Thou Shall Prosper by Rabbi Daniel Lappin is the best book on managing finances in a philosophical and spiritual way that makes sense. It's powerful and counterintuitive to a lot of common thinking. The other one, the third one then, is Deep Work by Cal Newport. It transformed my work week and how I frame my work week. So those are three I would highly recommend. The Noticer, Thou Shall Prosper, Deep Work. Beautiful. The Noticer, Thou Shall Prosper, and Deep Work. Yes. And, and about Deep Work, you have also something to share about how we can protect our mornings. Can you tell us more? I consider the morning the most important time of the day. One of my books is The Rudder of the Day, and it talks about that first hour of the day being the rudder, what your day is going to look like. So if you get up, you know, you're angry, gee, it's raining out, you're late, you jump in the car, traffic's bad, you honk the horn, you know, you get to work 10 minutes late, you've set the stage for what the day is going to be. I am very protective of that first part of the day. So I get up, I'm an early riser. Our children are grown and gone, so it's quiet in our house. My wife is not an early riser, so I have that early morning time. And the first thing I do is go into one of the rooms in our house here and drop in a floor and do some yoga stretches, just stretches. The next thing I do is walk through our house out loud expressing gratitude, just verbalizing gratitude. Then I head out the door. We live in a community where the circle is three and a half miles. So I walk that circle. A lot of times I'll walk it, then jump on my bike and do a couple laps on my bike as well. So a full hour, hour and a half of just heavy exercise, come back sweating. Then I take a shower. Then I meet my wife. We have a cup of tea together at that point, discuss what we're doing. That begins my day. But that first part, I control what I think about, what goes into my mind, exercising, meditating. Those are the kind of things that comprise the first two hours of my day. And, and really, I tell people, you know, what happens the rest of the day? I mean, I can handle anything if I set the stage by those first two hours. This is so important. And um, there are still people out there that in the first two hours of their day, they check their emails oh. or they listen to the news, which is both right now a very bad idea. Oh, it is. It is. That is not what I want in my brain last thing at night or first thing in the morning. Yeah, you know, during those two hours, yeah, I do not check email. I don't, you know, oh, now when I'm out walking, I often listen to a podcast. So I'll pull up a podcast, but I can control, that's going to be positive, clean, pure, inspiring information that's coming in. So I will do that, but nothing else. Yeah, don't turn on the TV. Here, we, everybody listening right now loves podcasts. What are podcasts that you find inspiring? Well, I listen to John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneur on Fire. You know, you know, you know Fire Nation, yeah. Yeah, you know, Pat Flynn. Uh, yeah. There's one I listened to this morning, Business Done Differently, Jesse Cole, who's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. He's on my 3 a.m. list. He owns the Savannah Bananas, a baseball team. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael Hyatt, um, Your Best Life, his podcast. I mean, I've got a pretty massive feed of podcasts that I listen to pretty regularly. 
This is beautiful. And the, the, the intentionality of that is strong. You make sure that the morning is made of things that support your day, that make you, that prepare you for the day where you will be heavily focused on relationship, on, on bringing value, on serving your community. And you, you, you want to get there with full batteries. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we can make those choices. I mean, we hear a lot of victim talk these days, especially in light of what happened last year where it was an unexpected change and a lot of people are feeling victimized. But wow, we have so many options, so many opportunities to see new ideas, new creative ways to keep moving forward. I love this. And uh, where can people get more of Dan Miller? Where do you hang out? <laughs> well, I appreciate that. 48 Days, as you know, is my brand, the title of one of my books. It was so powerful uh, that we made that our company name. It wasn't that originally, but at this point, so 48 Days, you put that in and uh, it's going to be pretty clear that I have a lot of activity under that. And that comes from the premise, Simon, that no matter what, where you are right now, you can change dramatically the direction of your life in 48 days if you create a plan and act on it. So you don't have to just wait until the kids are out of school or until you finish your own degree or pay off your student loan debts. Or, no, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. If we wait on that, there's always something that's just up ahead. Well, it's going to take a little longer. No, get rid of that thinking. 48 days is an ample time to assess where am I, get the advice and opinion of other people, identify three or four options, do a little bit more research, choose one and act. And that can have to do with what kind of car you're going to buy or where you're going to send the kids to college, where you're going to live, what kind of business you're going to start. That's a process. And that also, you know, with you being an a entrepreneur, a brand guy, that's a delineator for me. I mean, I'm essentially a career coach. If you put in career coaching in a search, you're going to get 13, 14 million sites. I'm in there somewhere. I'm sure I have no idea where. It doesn't matter. But you put in 48 days. I mean, I own that. Not through fancy SEO or buying spots, just because that's, I'm the guy who says, you know, you, let's not just wait until all the lights are green. I'm the guy who says you can change your life in 48 days. And that's worked extremely well for me. That's powerful. Thank you so much, Dan Miller, everybody. Go check out his books. And Dan, who should be my next guest? Nick Pavlidis. Hmm? Nick is an attorney who came to one of my events and decided to remake his life. Now, he's a very competent attorney, and he didn't just quit, but he created a two-year transition, and he changed totally. He dropped, he was in making, you know, a quarter of a million dollars. He dropped $100,000 for two years, and then he came back and has blown past that. He's a ghostwriter. He writes books for people who need to have their story told. And then he has a ghostwriter school, so he teaches other people to do that. So he's taken the skills that he understood as an attorney, and he's built this empire under the ghostwriting kind of banner. Neat, not guy. Greek guy, a lot of interesting family history. Yep, Nick Pavlidis. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Dan Miller, everybody, go get the book. And thank you so much, Dan. Hey, thank you. Thank Have you an so amazing much. day. Thank you.